So I made a video about five years ago, and it happens to be the most popular video on my channel. It also happens to be one that didn't receive the best reviews out of all the videos I've ever posted. It's called Beginner's Guide to Fly Fishing, How to Fly Fish. And with almost 650,000 views, there was a lot of negative comments. And while rightfully so, after rewatching the video, I can understand the confusion, there's still some good information in that video. So I'm not gonna take it down. But what I am going to do is redeem myself and actually teach you the beginner's guide to fly fishing. So if you came from that video, or if you just stumbled across this one, I'm going to take this in segments, and I'm gonna teach you exactly what you need to know about first and foremost, the fly rod, and all of the tools and things we need to set it up and rig it. And then I'll go into future videos about the nymphs and the dry flies you'll be using, as well as how to read the water and how to actually catch and cast to fish. So let's start today by just learning the basics of a fly rod setup. So I'm gonna start with the most obvious, the fly rod. So this right here is the butt end of a five weight, nine foot fly rod. Weight is a calculation of how much pressure this can put on a fish and the overall strength of the rod. So while you might see something with a medium action or a heavy action in conventional fishing, um, that would also give you, you know, maybe some sort of lure weight that is most commonly used. This right here comes in weights. This particular rod is a five weight. It is the most standard weight rod for pretty much anything you wanna do across the board fly fishing. You can use this in a small creek, although you may not want to. You can also use this on decent sized rainbows. About the only thing you don't wanna to try to use this on is larger fish, like big lake trout, redfish, tarpon, things maybe in salt water, a five weight's not gonna stand up very well. You can still catch the fish, but you might be really tired at the end of it. So this is a nine foot, Almost every fly rod that's sold is sold in pieces. And I think it's one for portability, but two, I mean, it's just really hard to own a one piece nine foot fly rod, unless you have some sort of fly rod holder um, or a really, really long car or truck. Um, it's pretty impractical to carry a nine foot rod. Um, so it comes in sections, makes it really transportable. And on the inside of just about any temple fork rod, there's a little dot, and this little dot will help you in lining up the next piece. I'll show you. See those little two dots? So we just wanna spin them so they line up and then push them together. After you've done that for every segmented piece, you'll now have a fully assembled fly rod. It literally couldn't get any simpler. Now you'll notice on these rods, the last two guides, they look very traditional. Um, they're your standard circle guides. And then up at the top of the rod, you have more of these looped guides. And the looped guides are more allowing the fly line to easily glide through versus what you might find with a standard circle guide. So those ones are not quite small enough to make a difference, but these ones, especially at the tip of the rod, are definitely uh, enough to make a difference. This helps the line slide a little bit easier um, in your cast. The last thing about the fly rod is down here at the bottom is obviously where you're going to attach your reel. Has a little sliding reel seat and then this particular rod has two spinning nuts that will help lock the fly rod and reel together. Some will have a fighting butt on the bottom, some will not. This is just a manner of preference, and usually you'll find on bigger rods, heavier weight rods, that they will have more of a fighting butt. So let's talk real quickly about fly rod length. A rod can come in multiple different lengths. Nine foot is a fairly common length of fly rod. We wanna balance kind of what situation we'll be in with also the castability of the rod. So when I'm in a tight, small creek, a nine foot may be a little bit too long for me, 
and I may want to shorten it up to like an eight or maybe even a seven and a half. Um, I'd also probably be looking at like a three weight rod for a small creek rod um, versus a five weight for something that's maybe more standard river size like the South Platte. Um, a nine foot five weight I would say is the most standard and I don't deviate from that often, um, but you can get longer rods like a 10 foot. And I know a lot of people that use 10 foot rods, um, they'll actually use that extra foot as a way to almost extend out into the water and drift their rod without doing a ton of casting. So it gives you a little bit more of a reach. Uh, 10 foot will obviously help you cast lighter flies further, um, where an eight or a seven would be a little bit more difficult. And that's just kind of standard physics. Um, but I would say if you're starting out a nine foot five, nine foot uh, four weight, somewhere in that uh, range would be probably one of the best beginner rods and something that'll last you a long time. And then when you end up teaching somebody, it's a great learning rod as well. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the rod, let's talk about the reel. Although it looks a lot different than a reel that you're used to, like a bait caster or spinning reel, it functions almost the exact same. Uh, the difference being how it lays the line onto the rod. Um, so on the back of this BVK reel, you've got this little drag knob here, and that just correlates to the drag of the reel. Heavier fish, you're gonna want it tighter. For smaller fish, you're gonna want it lighter. Very simple. So instead of having the line come off of the near side of the reel, it comes off the outside of the reel. This gives you an advantage when you're casting to reach out and hold the line with also not getting your hands in the way when you are casting. So it gives you kind of a dual purpose. So the line is always spooled on the outside of the reel. Keeps your hands free of the line, but when you need to reach out and grab it to set the hook, you can easily pinch it off. So there's a lot of maintaining line and these reels are designed to deal with that. So on my reel here, I have a floating fly line. This is a five weight and all fly line corresponds to the weight of the rod. Obviously you don't want too thick or it won't fit through your guides. So it's gotta correspond with the weight of the rod and what you're after. So this is a five weight forward floating line forward weighted meaning that more of the weight is in the front of the line than the back so it allows it to push out the end of your rod a little bit easier when you're casting. Then behind that at the back of this is what we call our backing. The backing is what the fly line attaches to and it's actually part of what makes a fly reel colorful um, but you can see in here I have kind of a white line and that is a backing. It's almost like a thread consistency or um, you could probably look at it as like a Dacron sheathing for lead core. Um, but what it's doing is that is giving you extra line in case of a large fish. Um, this is something I've never used in my history of fly fishing in Colorado because I've never caught a fish big enough to spool me out. Um, either that or if they were, I broke them off. Um, but basically the, the backing is to give you a lot more um, than is necessary if you have a bigger fish. And number two, just as braid slides on metal, um, so does fly line. So it gives the fly line something to bite so that when you do get to the end of the fly line, you've got something to help reel in that fly line without it slipping around the reel. Um, the only other thing to really note about a fly reel is that they do have spools that come off. This one comes off as well. Um, there's just a little toggle in the front of the spool and then I can just pull it straight off of the base. So what you could do is you could have multiple spools with different weights of line and then you can end up switching out in the day, right? So I'm fishing the South Platte, maybe I need a five and then, oh, I wanna go to a small creek, I grab my other spool and I put it on and now I have a three weight and I can switch out my rod to a three weight. Um, so very convenient, uh, super easy, easy parts. And these are very durable reels. Although you don't want to always get them wet, these are made to get wet. Um, so you'll see a lot of guys taking pictures with their reel in the water 
While I wouldn't recommend doing that in the winter time, it usually is generally pretty safe for a flywheel. Okay, so we've been through a rod and we've been through the reel and we know how to mount the reel on the rod. After we mount the rod and the reel together, we are left with basically a loop knot or perfection loop at the end of the fly line. This is either done by your local pro shop if you did have this uh, tied up or, or spooled up by the local shop, um, or you can Google nail knot or perfection loop and you can figure out exactly how to make this. Um, I like loop to loop connections. I think they're easier to deal with. Um, but at the end of your fly line, we obviously can't fish with this. The fish would see it. Um, and the name of the game is to match the hatch and make them believe they're actually eating a little bug. So we want to kind of hide that. And how we do that is with two different materials. One is a leader and the next is a tippet. Tippet, I always was very confused on what they meant by tippet. Tippet is nothing different than a line. Um, it comes in fluorocarbon, you can get it in mono, you can get it in a whole bunch of different things. I prefer fluorocarbon, uh, nylon, there's, there's plenty of different types of tippet. But when you hear the word tippet, just think fly line. I like loop to loop connections because I think they're very easy to manage. Um, what connects to this loop knot is what we call a leader. A leader can be bought in packages. I actually have a couple packages here and they have some numbers on them. Um, this is a nine foot leader. It is a four X diameter and it can handle about 6.4 pounds. So what this means is this whole leader in this pack is nine foot. The size of it is a four X that is a tippet size. So that would be something great for a five weight rod. You might move this up if you wanted to save on leaders. Um, but in general, I think a four or a five X will do just fine. Um, what this leader is at one end, it's very fat, very similar to this fly line. And at the other end, it's very, very thin. So it looks exactly like a whip would function. Very thick handle at the bottom. And then as you get out towards the end, it gets very, very narrow. And that allows for when you're casting for the last thing to hit the water is the most narrow, lightest part of the line. And that's exactly why we use a leader. So this will have a loop to loop connection and you'll connect the loops together and then you'll run out your leader. Here's another example of a leader. This is a 3X. So you can buy these in all shapes and sizes, but just know you'll want to have a leader. Okay, so now is where we can make things super simple or super complicated like my last video. I wanna to try to simplify this. So I use what's called a tippet ring and this is a pack of them. So it's not this actual snap. You can barely see them, but they're tiny, tiny little rings on the very end of the snap. The snap is just used to hold them. And I tie those to the very end of my leader. And the reason that I do that is because I don't like buying leaders. I think it's less expensive to have to replace a tippet ring or whatever comes after it than having to keep replacing your leaders. So I use tippet rings. So at the very end of my leader, I will tie this on with whatever knot you see fit. I like polymer knots a lot in fly fishing, but there's plenty of knots out there that are just as good. But I tie a tippet ring to the end of my leader so that if it breaks, it breaks at the tippet ring, not on the leader because the leaders are more expensive and I'm just cheap. So that's why I use a tippet ring. There's a small argument that a tippet ring will help the angle of your fly in the water be a little bit more true to where the current is going. So that's another reason that I kind of like them, but I don't know how much validity there is to that. So tippet ring is the next thing that I put on. So beyond that, I was talking in my previous video about how many flies you could potentially tie on to your leader or how I normally fish mine. But as a beginner, I would set it up a lot different. So you have to decide on what type of fishing you're doing. Here in Colorado, if you're in the summertime, you could do a lot on top water where you're actually looking for the fish to come up and sip the fly off the surface and you can see your bug all the way down the river. But in other scenarios, you can't actually fish that way because the fish aren't looking up for their food. So that's where you need to do something called nymphing. 
And nymphing is where you are using a bug um, or a fly or something that hasn't hatched yet and it's underneath the surface, subsurface, and that's where primarily the feeding goes on for trout in streams. Um, so with that being said, you need to kind of decide, are you fishing more in the spring, summer, where you might have some bugs falling out of the grass onto um, the water? If you sat on the riverbank for 10 minutes, did you see anything come up and sipping? Is there a trico hatch? And you're having a lot of these bugs fall into the water and die. Um, and the fish are coming up and eating those. You kind of have to decide, are you doing dry fly or are you doing nymphing? But I would say primarily 80% of the feeding that happens is gonna happen nymphing, and then the rest will be happening on that top water bite for a few months over summer. So let's talk briefly about, so let's talk briefly about dry fly fishing because it'll be quicker and then we'll get into a little bit more detail on the nymphing. So with dry fly fishing, after your leader, and your tippet ring, you'll tie on a small section of tippet, and that is what this whole tippet spool is holding. And I have different sizes, 6X, 5X, 8X, 4X. It's all on here. And that way I can decide what diameter I want for my line. I would say in most scenarios, 4X will work for a dry fly, but you may wanna to go to six or seven in addition to having a whole bunch of different sizes, I also have different types of line. So I have power flex, which is more of like a polymer line, more like a mono maybe. And then you've got your fluoro flex, which is a true fluorocarbon line. A fluorocarbon line is better for nymphing because it goes under the water, it sinks faster and the fish can't see it. Where a power flex or a nylon line might be better for dry flies because it sets on the surface a little bit easier. Um, so I would tie on like a short piece of let's say 5x tippet and then I would tie on my dry fly and I would primarily just fish with the dry fly Little short lead of 5x tippet to my tippet ring and then from my tippet ring to my leader and my leader back To this green fly line and that would be my whole setup starting out for just fly fishing Then I'd be looking for riffles or runs where I see fish rising and I try to put my fly right in front of it and let it drift all the way through and do it again. Um, and that primarily would be a setup that I would use for dry fly fishing. Now, a couple things to talk about when it comes to dry fly fishing is two products. One is called Blue Ribbon and one is called a quell. A quell is like a grease that you can put on your fly that helps keep it afloat. And Blue Ribbon is after your fly is wet it's like a dry powder that helps keep your fly afloat. So these two products you can put on your flies to help keep them on the surface. If you wet a fly enough, it will sink. Um, if it has a lot of foam on it, it may be okay, but most flies will sink if they don't have this on it, especially like uh, a spinner fall trico, uh, which is basically a, a dead trico on the top of the surface. Um, if you're trying to fish that on the surface, you'd absolutely need some of these to keep it afloat with the weight of the hook. Um, so blue ribbon and a quell. A quell for before your fly is wet and blue ribbon for after your fly is wet. Okay, so now that we know dry fly fishing as a beginner, let's talk real quickly about nymph fishing or subsurface fishing. Again, this is primarily where a lot of the feeding happens. In the winter time, this is where you're gonna find most of your success. Or maybe you're at a tailwater and you've seen some of my videos using a mysa shrimp. Uh, this would be another example of how we do that um, using this nymphing method. Um, nymphing is what it's called, but you're using a whole bunch of different styles of bugs. It could be shrimps, it could be nymphs, it could be um, you know, big bugs like a Pat's rubber legs, which is an imitation of a stone fly. Um, but basically speaking, your setup doesn't change very much until after the tippet ring. So I still have my floating fly line, I still have my leader, and I still have my tippet ring at the end of that leader. So I can switch over from dry fly to nymphing with just touching what's after my tippet ring. And this is another reason I use tippet rings is because I can switch up very, very quickly. So after my tippet ring, I would tie on a piece of tippet that is about equivalent to the depth of water I'm fishing. So if that's three feet, then it's a three foot line. If that's six foot, then it's a six foot line. I wanna give myself a lot of distance between that tippet ring so that I can really get this fly down and sunk into the water really, really well. 
Um, so what I'll do is I'll tie on a piece of tippet, and then at the end of that tippet, I would tie my wet fly. So this could be, again, a nymph, it could be a mycy shrimp, it could be uh, any sort of underwater subsurface fly. Um, usually you'll see them, they're very thin, they don't have a lot to them, they might have a little hair on them, but usually they just look like a hook and some, some thread. Um, those are gonna be mostly the midges and, and nymphs that you'll be using for that underwater uh, presentation. Some of them have a bead in them that helps them sink. Some of them need a little bit of help. So that's where you'll use weights. And this weight is uh, egg shots and they come in all different sizes. I like the ones that are green or black because they blend in really well versus like a bright silver. Again, you're trying to imitate something that's real underneath the water. So seeing a weight isn't advantageous to that. Um, but depending on the speed of the water and depending on the weight of the fly already, you may need to add some split shot to get it down. When I'm doing mysis shrimp fishing in the Blue River in four feet of water, I may use one B or one size six, um, where if I'm in Deckers in a fast, deep drift, I may use a couple BBs or a couple AAs um, just to make sure that I get it down. So uh, weights are essential to getting your fly down and usually those will set anywhere from like, I don't know, 12 to 18 inches above your fly. Um, so again, you're tying from your tippet ring to your fly a section of tippet that is equal to the depth of water. And then you're adding about 18 inches above that fly some weight if you need to help get it down. Now, like the Loon products, Aquel and Blue Ribbon, there also is Gink. Gink is a, it's a sinking product and this helps keep your fly down. Um, so the rift doesn't move it up too quickly or try to keep it out of the zone. So you can actually use gink or sink uh, to keep it down. Um, so just like the Aquel to keep things floating, this is used to keep your fly down. So we have gink and we have weight to get our fly to the bottom. So now we need to know how to catch a fish when we can't see the fish actually taking. With dry flies, it's very easy because you're watching the fish sip off the surface. Um, but when it comes to seeing on the underwater side, you need a little help. And that's where we turn towards what we call in fly fishing indicators. But if you've been fishing forever, you know it as a bobber. Um, these right here are called thingamabobbers. And they just have a little cap on the top that you unscrew and you lay your line in the slot and then you screw the cap back over the top of the line. There's a little rubber gasket in there that helps kind of pinch the line between the lid and the bottom, and that will hold your line exactly where you want that bobber to be. You just need to make sure that this bobber is about one and a half the times depth of your water on your line. So if we're in six feet of water, I have this about nine feet. If we're in three feet of water, I have this about four, four and a half feet. You wanna have your indicator well above the depth of the water so you can see an immediate strike, but not so far that things start to drag. So this is gonna help kind of keep your fly in that perfect drift. These are also a visual indicator, not only of when you get a bite, but if your nymph is drifting perfectly through the water. You see, these fish are keen to how things move in the water. They see it every day around the same rock. They see it every day over the same log. They want to know that that fly is drifting perfectly because if it's not, they don't know or think it's real. Um, so this is a great indicator to also show you as it's moving through the water how your drift is going. If you impart any deviation to your drift, that fish may not bite, and you need to know that. So you wanna be able to see an indicator on the surface that gives you a really clear idea of what's happening. Now these might be great for stained water. I use these in just about any scenario, but sometimes you do need to be a little bit more sly and that's where maybe a clear indicator would come in handy. Um, or I also have this little box here of yarn. Um, and these indicators work in a very similar manner. They're tied onto the line in a very similar way. Um, but basically the yarn 
allows you to kind of pretend like you're maybe a dead leaf. Um, or in the fall time, uh, you know, dead foliage of a maple tree. Um, you got reds, you know, maybe something you, you think of in like Vermont, right? Vermont maples. Um, so you can use different indicators. The, the main point is that you want to be able to see your indicator and know when you're getting a bite. So thingamabobbers, yarn, whatever you decide, you need some sort of indicator. The last indicator that I'll show you in the last part of this segment is basically indicator coils. Um, these are used a lot in Euro nymphing. These are put in line in between your fly and your leader so that you can know when you're getting a bite as a visual indicator. What they are is they're very coiled up and when you get them tied to your line, they stay coiled up. But as soon as a fish bites, they stretch. And when they stretch a little bit, that's when you know to set the hook. So these are more of a natural indicator on the line versus one that's actually floating in the water. And the school of thought is that this might apply some drag, which it can, and this would be a little bit more finesse fishing um, and give you an idea of what's happening immediately to your fly where this might have a little bit of play in terms of what you're seeing. So this is the last indicator that you could use. There's plenty of other uh, styles of this, but I like the coil indicators if I was Euro nymphing. Um, and again, this just goes in between your tippet ring and your fly so that you know um, when you get bit versus using something like this thingamabobber. So I hope that helped a little bit and I apologize again for my last video and kind of the negative criticism that it received, but I still think there's a lot of good elements in that video. So if you wanna skip the first section that talks about rigging and just kind of follow this for your rigging procedure and then just move on to hearing a little bit more about how to see what an indicator looks like when a fish bites and also how to read the water, I think there's still some relevant information there. Um, but this is the first part in my series of how to fly fish um, as a beginner and this is all of the rigging. Um, so if you guys have any questions, please leave them down below. Let me know if there's something that I forgot and I'd be happy to answer anything down in the comments below to help you get started in your beginning of learning fly fishing. Thanks for watching Catching Colorado and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in more relatable content, you can check out these videos right here. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe down below so you can stay updated on our next adventures.